You grab your hymnals, but we're going to read them on the screen as usual. Amen. We welcome let's, you this let's morning. Sing to we the welcome Lord. The, the our friends and neighbors that's on Facebook. Thank you for being with us. And because of Thanksgiving, we're going to tell you how thankful we are. for me. We gather together. <laughs> we gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. He chastens and hastens his will to make known the wicked oppressing now cease from the stressing. Thank you, Lord. Beside us to guide us, our God, with us joining, ordaining, maintaining His kingdom divine. So from the beginning, the fight we were winning, the Lord was at our side. All glory be Good. 
Jesus, we just want to praise you. Jesus, we just want to praise you. Praise you for being so good. Savior, we just want to serve you. for singing. You may be seated. All right. Welcome. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here this wonderful Sunday morning. We trust and hope that your experience here has already been a blessing. Appreciate you and your faithfulness to the Lord during these difficult and unusual times, like the fact that it's warm out. You know, it's supposed to be November, huh? Now, I know you think I was going to say something different, but I'm tired of it, amen? Let's get to some cool weather, amen? Let's get some things done. But you know what? Uh, we live in a world uh, that is uh, still under the authority uh, of the Lord. He's still on the throne, and he still is working out all things for his honor and his glory. And uh, the Bible talks about uh, different times or seasons, and it also talks about uh, things that are in season and things that are out of season. And uh, we uh, uh, should be mindful of that truth, uh, that uh, the world is fallen and there will be good times and there will be lean times. There will be wonderful blessings and harvests filled with bountiful things. And there will be some lean times where uh, we'll be required to get on our knees and call upon the name of of the Lord. Well, <clears throat> we've got some uh, important announcements, some things that we need to consider today uh, in the life and ministry here at Canyon Springs Baptist Church. And so uh, we got a, quite a few announcements, but I want to mention a couple of really important things. Um, there is a sign up sheet in the foyer for anyone interested in becoming a member or knowing or learning about what it takes to be a member or what our passions or what our uh, beliefs are here at Canyon Springs, uh, what are our beliefs about being a family in God, family in Christ, growing together. And so there is an opportunity for you to go to the core class. Now, uh, several have tried to sign up twice and come just for the food. They've tried to do that. And I said, no, it's for people that have never been to the class, okay, and all this. So uh, if you've never been to the core class, it's a very personable, very uh, small group style or, or, or feeling. Uh, we'll be at my house, and uh, we're going to invite you over. We're going to have a nice meal. We're going to fellowship, and uh, we're going to go over some information about our church, what we believe, uh, what are our core beliefs, and that's why we call it the core class, our core beliefs. What are we passionate about? What do we believe about the Bible? What do we believe about man? What do we believe about Jesus? John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So we believe that Jesus is the only way. And so you're going to hear about all of these things, and uh, uh, it's very informational. We're going to talk about uh, the history of our church, the beginnings. We're going to talk about uh, my family, so I get to talk about each one of the, just, I won't, I promise, okay, I, I won't do that. Uh, but we're going to talk about lots of wonderful things and have opportunities to share our lives together, and uh, I think it's been very helpful for those that have attended that, and I think it'll be helpful for you. I think we have a pretty good group signed up, so you won't be the only one. There's still room. Feel free to sign up 
And this is a, uh, one of those opportunities that if you come to the class, uh, there is um, no pressure, no sales pressure. Uh, it's purely informational. Uh, there is going to be no pressure to become a member or to join the secret society. That was a joke, by the way. Okay. Um, but there's going to be no pressure to do that. We just want you to be well informed. Uh, we believe that every Christian ought to have three homes. A home in heaven when they leave this earth, their fleshly body, right? And we also think they ought to have a home when you go to at the end of the workday where you feel comfortable, you have a roof over your head, you can uh, fellowship with your family and be safe. But we also understand deeply how important a spiritual family, a church family is so important to the believer. And we think it's a priority to be a part of a local body of believers, worshiping the Lord, praying together, giving together, serving together, and loving one another. And so we want to be mindful of those things. So any questions about that, please feel free uh, to see me, and uh, we'd love to maybe get you on that and love to just to get to know you. Like I said, um, there's going to be opportunities for you uh, to, to know what it takes to become a member of Canyon Springs Baptist Church, and uh, there's going to be opportunities for you to evaluate all of that and uh, there's information going to be given. So that's what's really, really important about that class. And I'd love for you to just to even get the chance to meet you on a different level in a small group. That would be a blessing, and I sure would love to do that. Um, tonight, tonight is exciting. Uh, we are going to be meeting back in person uh, tonight, in here at 6 o'clock tonight. And we're starting our uh, Sunday nights in-person services tonight. But we're also doing it uh, with a beginning of participating together in the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper service. Now, for the believer, this is an amazing time to fellowship with the Lord. This is an opportunity that you and I have to uh, fellowship with the Lord in a different way, uh, to be obedient to Him and to partake of the elements as they are a memorial of what the Lord has done for us on the cross. And we're going to celebrate in the cross. We're going to celebrate in his death, and we're going to desire to partake in these elements together as a church family. And the Bible says, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And so we are going to remember the Lord tonight. So how's that go? In uh, what we're going to do is um, uh, there's going to be a table in that foyer. You're going to walk into service tonight at six o'clock. I encourage you to come and have your hearts prepared. The Bible says uh, in the book of First Corinthians, it says, but let a man examine himself to see if he is worthy. And so there is some important part of us that we need to do is go to the Lord, ask the Lord, hey, am I what I should be at this moment to partake in this very important ceremony of the Lord's Supper? And so we should examine ourselves. So I want to encourage you this afternoon, take some time to do that. Be prayerful about it. Be thoughtful about it. And then when you come, uh, we're going to have a, our service, and uh, we're going to have some singing. Uh, we're going to have uh, a time in God's Word, but we're also at the end of service going to partake. So we'd encourage you to come and, and grab uh, one of the um, uh, communion, uh, you know, uh, little things. Amen. I don't know what to call them, uh, but they have the wafer in it, and they have the, it's all like, you know, one shot, okay? Uh, and so you take that in. They've uh, totally sanitized. You're going to be the only human being that touched it. It's going to be out there. And uh, you're just going to grab that, and you're going to have that with you in service. And at the end of the service, we'll give you instructions about when to partake. And then when we partake of the bread, we're going to pray together. We're going to partake together and celebrate. And then we're going to partake together uh, with the juice at a separate time. And so uh, I know some of you are going to think, hey, let's just, you know, one shot. Let's get this over with. Let's move on. Uh, but please be patient in that, and you'll see that there's a value in uh, remembering the Lord throughout all of these things. And so please feel free to come on in and prepare your hearts for the Lord's Supper service tonight. And of course, it is Thanksgiving, and let me tell you, there is so much to be thankful for. Amen. There is so much to be thankful for. I know we could talk about the things we're not thankful for. Anybody can do that. But listen, believer, we need to make sure that we are constantly mindful of things that we are thankful for yeah. and that the Lord has blessed us with. And so tonight, 
uh, we're going to sing several songs, and I'm going to give opportunity for, from our congregation. Uh, in the middle of those verses, in the middle of those songs, uh, we're going to uh, ask you to be thankful for something. We're going to ask you, if you'd like to, you could share with the church congregation maybe something the Lord has pressed upon your heart to be thankful for, and we're going to rejoice yeah. with you tonight. And that's during the song service. And so come on in. Like I said, uh, we're going to sing a few hymns. We're going to receive a message regarding the memorial of the Lord's Supper. And then we will receive um, the elements together as a family. And then we will return home rejoicing and being thankful for our wonderful Savior. So that's what's going to happen tonight at 6 o'clock. Amen. Well, uh, be mindful. I think there's the... Um, we have uh, the core classes on the 6th, uh, and I believe the Christmas party is on the 11th, is it? The Christmas party is Friday the 11th at 7 o'clock, and uh, we're working on a few things. We're gonna probably going to be having our uh, cr adult Christmas party outdoors. We're going to have it out underneath the, the shade structure. We're going to have it all lit up with lights, and I think it'll be really nice. It'll be a nice time. And if you would like to avail yourselves of that opportunity to celebrate uh, Christmas with your church family, that would be a great time for you to mark on your calendars, make sure you're here, and uh, bring a gift, if you will, um, a very simple gift, $5 or less. It could be anything. You can make cookies. You can make peanut brittle. Uh, you can make something in the woodworking shop. But just, you know, you could do anything. It doesn't have to cost anything. Um, but we ask that you be creative about it and wrap it up. It doesn't necessarily have to be for a guy or a girl or anything. Uh, and we are going to have a wonderful time gift exchange that night. And we always have a few laughs along the way, and I expect the same to be happening. Uh, anything else, Trace, that you had? Yes, thank you. Man, a lot of announcements I said, and, and I, I forgot one of them. Uh, but uh, so it's been kind of fast and furious, hasn't it? A lot of things going on here, a lot of things going on in our country. And uh, so I wanted to apologize. Normally we kind of uh, announce, give you a little bit of time when we change a service time. I always like to do that, give extra time. Uh, but for the last several years, the week of Thanksgiving, uh, we've always typically moved our midweek service, which is 6 o'clock on Wednesdays, we move that to Tuesday. And so we are going to move that service, so it's going to be this Tuesday at 6 o'clock, right in here, and we're going to be thankful, and we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving together, and a message on Thanksgiving, and I think it'll be a real encouragement to you, and so be planning on that uh, this Tuesday, okay? This Tuesday is our midweek service, so we wouldn't have one on Wednesday, and uh, we encourage you to make sure you spend time with your family course on Thanksgiving and all those things that go on there. Uh, be mindful of that. All right, let's turn in our Bibles to this morning uh, to Ruth, the story of Ruth, chapter number three. Story of Ruth, chapter number three. And uh, it's so good to see you here, and uh, we hope and trust that God's people have been a blessing to you. Uh, we are uh, of course, very concerned about you, your health. Uh, we want you to make sure that you do whatever you feel necessary uh, to protect yourself uh, with your health. And we uh, want to support you in any of those regards. If you'd like to wear a mask, you feel free to do that. If you'd like to, uh, if you feel uh, so inclined, uh, then... Uh, you need to stay home if, you, if that's what you feel like. We have provided our services live on Facebook Live, each and every one, and we'd love to fellowship with you. I know many are here uh, probably watching with us. We're so glad that you are. We're so glad that you're worshiping the Lord with us. And we hope and trust that God's word will be a blessing to you as we are gathering here in person here this morning. So we've been uh, taking a small journey in the life of Ruth, in the story of Ruth, of the book of Ruth. It's four chapters, 85 verses. It's a short book of the Bible, but it's a very important book of the Bible, and there's so many scriptural principles throughout this 
Uh, and there's so many lessons to be learned. Uh, I think everyone's story is important. I think the story of life, I think uh, your story of your salvation, I think the story of what God is doing in your life is uh, an interesting one, a valuable one, and a really important one to share and to be a part of. I'm mindful of my own story, uh, the twists and the turns and the detours at times. None of you have ever had a detour in your story, have you? Or am I the only one? Okay. So we're all kind of similar, I'm pretty sure. And, uh, but Ruth is, uh, uh, gives us a story of three main individuals, Naomi, the mother-in-law, Ruth, the young widow, and of course, Boaz, uh, the very well-to-do, rich in character, very well-established Jewish man who becomes the kinsman redeemer for both Naomi and both Ruth and comes to uh, the rescue, so to speak, for these two widows. Chapter 2, as we begin to think about 3 today, but I want to just to kind of be mindful of what's happened in chapter 2. We know that they're widows, they're starving, they don't know what to do, they don't know what is going to happen to them in their life, they really have no one to take care of them. And so Ruth says, I'm going to go, I'm going to try to go work and I'm going to try to go glean in the fields behind the, 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 the reapers and I'm going to try to just gather some food so maybe we can eat today and it just so happened. And of course, you know, we talked about the providence of God, we've talked about the provision of God, how that, yes, it might have just so happened for her that day, but God had a plan, a big one. And she just so happened to be in that field that day. And it just so happened that God provided for her that day and Naomi that day, but also for that week and also for the whole entire harvest. Ruth was able to gra- have that job of gathering after the reapers with Boaz and his maidens and in his, under his protection. And we see here that she said that Boaz spoke to her and was a comfort to her. He was a kind individual. He noticed people. He noticed things. He noticed strangers. And as he was being a blessing, and as he was being kind to this widow, who he allowed, because God has so graciously and bountifully blessed him, He was a wealthy man. He was a a, a mighty man, the Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 2. And it just so happened that she went to his field. It just so happened that Boaz uh, was a close kinsman redeemer, whereas they could maybe go be a part of his family and they would be able to have a life and be able to have an inheritance and be able to, that the land that God gave Elimelech and his family would not go by the wayside, but would be protected for the name of Elimelech and the name of his future heirs. Now, we all see this happening. She's working tirelessly in the fields every single day, long hours. Many of you work long hours. Many of you are uh, take time and and, and work difficult jobs and jobs you might not necessarily like. And, and I can just imagine every day, but noticing that God provided this situation. It just so happened she didn't know where she was going to go, but God led her to Boaz's field. And now she has an opportunity to every day she's protected. She can go without fear. She can go and reap. And you know what? She can even have the water that the men that have already drawn up. And so it's a good situation for someone that began the chapter with no hope. And as she is working every day, God is working in the scenes. And here we see in chapter 3, if you will, we see love happening. Love begins to bud. Love begins to... To, to happen in some way or some fashion, and, and they somehow know of each other, they somehow notice each other, and there comes a time 
where uh, everything, if you will, comes to a head. And we see that it happens in several dis- different scenes. And I, I want you to notice with me chapter 3, and we're going to read a couple chapters, but here is this first scene. It's a love story. Notice how it begins in verse number 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, wait a minute, some of you say, what's the mother-in-law have to do with all of this? How many of you had a mother-in-law in your relationship? Okay. Interesting. Then Naomi said to her mother-in-law, or said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred? with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he widoweth barley in the night in the threshing floor. Wash thyself, therefore, anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be that when he lieth down, thou shalt mark that place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet." And lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And he said unto her, this is what Ruth is saying to her mother-in-law, all that thou sayest unto me, I will do. Well, we see Naomi is becoming the matchmaking mother-in-law. Has that ever been your story? I don't know. Has that ever happened? I'm sure it has. But I, we see in verse number one of this passage that obviously Naomi is very concerned with Ruth. That's a good thing to be concerned for other people that are around you. Very concerned for her because she knew the culture. She knew what was happening. She knew that really uh, two widows really probably could not continue this way, gleaning after the reapers, so to speak. And they needed someone to rescue them, someone to help them, someone to redeem them, if you will, if they were going to be able to live on and have a fruitful life. And so Naomi says, now, daughter. Now, she was concerned. She says, my daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee? Now think of, day, think of Ruth every single day, every single day going out early, coming home late, every single day uh, gathering of the sheaves and gathering of that and beating out the barley and, and taking some 30 pounds to 60 pounds. And, and, and this was hard work. And every day she would do this and she probably came home tired a little bit. How many of you have ever been tired? But the mother-in-law, was; she obviously looked at Ruth, and she says, I, I want some rest for you. I don't want you to have to work so hard. I don't want you to have to wonder about your future. I don't want you to have to. Uh, but so there was good concern. And I think Naomi knew that it only takes a spark to get a fire going, right? And so if we could just get these two together, and, and, and if we could just introduce them, if if Ruth could just be in the right place at the right time, then maybe the spark of love might grow. It's interesting that as she gives this counsel, she says, okay, look at this counsel. She says, wash thyself, verse 3, therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor, but not make not the self known. So she's given her some counsel. Hey, do your hair, okay? Wash up a little bit. Put some makeup on. Look presentable. A couple times I, 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 we, we FaceTime my daughter Reagan. She's in Pensacola and they're wearing masks all the time. So we're like, don't you put makeup on? Well, we got masks on. What's the deal, you know? <laughs> and so we see that there was some good counsel. And typically, the, the culture of the day would be that Ruth, because she was a widow, she would wear certain attire that was very symbolic of her in her mourning, in her being a widow. And so everyone knew she was a widow in mourning. 
So this was a symbol that when she changed her clothes and she got ready and she anointed herself that, okay, maybe she's available. Maybe she would be uh, uh, available for marriage, so to speak. And so she changed some things and she went on there. Have you noticed verse, fi- uh, uh, verse number five here? Uh, what did Ruth do? She says, all that thou sayest unto me, I will do. How many of you want your kids to say that to you? Anyone? If I had a sign-up sheet and say, hey, if you sign this up, you know, you can have one wish, and your kids would say, all that thou sayest, mom and dad, I will do. I'm pretty sure that sign-up sheet would be full, right? And some people would even uh, uh, make up a name and sign up, you know, and vote twice, so to speak, right? They would do that. All because why? They wanted something like this. But Ruth was willing to do even though she didn't understand the culture, even though she didn't understand what this all meant, she was willing to listen and to take counsel. Have you ever took counsel? Well, I've never needed it. Have you been listening on Wednesday night? We were talking about people you can't help. Well, listen, we got to get to the place where we listen And when it's our time to take some counsel, let's take some counsel. We don't know how helped we can be if we just lower our pride a little bit and humble ourselves and say, I'm going to take some counsel. And so she complied. And verse number six begins the second scene of where she begins to go. And uh, it's at a different time, not in the morning, it's at a different time. Everyone has been working, and we see here in verse 6, she says, and she went down unto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn, and she came softly and uncovered her feet and laid her down. Uncovered his feet and laid her down. It came to pass at midnight, The man was afraid and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. What was happening here? This was a little unusual. Um, The men were all there, and they were working very difficulty. They were at the threshing floor. They were at at a high place. They weren't in some barn or anything. They were at a very high place outdoors, and this is where they would cast up Uh, the barley or the wheat or whatever it might be, and the chaff would be blown away and whatever they would have left. And so they've been working lots deep into the evening, and finally they had a meal out there, and they laid themselves, and Ruth noticed that she went, and it was a a little unusual. Uh, It was interesting what she did. She softly came, laid down underneath his feet, And uncovered his feet. What is the deal with that? Probably very symbolic, but if you can kind of think about uh, maybe the guy's feet got cold, and so he woke up. And he noticed there was this woman there laying at his feet. Um, Quite unusual. But I'm pretty sure they didn't have e-harmony during this time. I'm pretty sure they didn't have match. Steve, tell me which ones they all are. (laughs) Christian Mingle. Mingle. What else, Steve? Match.com. Match.com. Come on now. Can't think of of anyone else. If I have any questions about that kind of stuff, I go to Steve. He is the expert. And uh, (laughs) e-harmony, all that. So they didn't have all this Uh, ways to meet each other. I mean, it used to be we would just meet each other at a common place. Maybe it would be at work. You know, Al and Barb met at the Piggly Wiggly. Remember that? Uh, No? Was it at the... Was it at one of your rock rock band shows? Was it... I I met Barb. I was dating her older sister at the time. I'm liking that. But where did you meet each other? Mike and Mary, almost 50 years, met at McDonald's, right, Mike? Sears. Sears, Sears and Rob. <laughs> I mean, you know, we have, we're going all around, and, and uh, uh, Steve and Sydney Day, they're here from Maine, and, 
And we, we asked about that earlier this week, and, and uh, Cindy says, yes, he came over to buy a horse from my dad. And I said, Steve, did you try to buy her at, when you're trying to buy the horse? Is that what was going on? No, he says, no, no. But people meet in all different kinds of ways, and, and the culture was a little different here. Um, and so this was very unusual, and really... Uh, this was a marriage proposal. This was her saying she laid herself down, she uncovered her feet, and notice what happened when he woke up. And it came to pass that he was afraid, he turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet, and he says, Who art thou? It was dark out there. She answers, I am Ruth, thy handmaid. Spread forth thy skirt over thine handmaiden, for thou art a near Kinsman. She was pretty bold, pretty clear, and pretty blunt. She basically asked Boaz, let's get hitched. <laughs> she uncovered his feet, and the man's feet were cold, and she said, spread your skirt over me. Now, what that means is, uh, you remember earlier in the passage where he, sa uh, he said that Ruth was an honorable woman, and whose wings, talking about the Lord, whose wings thou now art underneath the protection of, the God of Israel. And so this was, hey, go ahead and take me under your wing, under your protection, into your family. So this was a marriage proposal. Years ago, I, I, I would joke around a little bit in, in, in the pulpit. I've learned to do a little less uh, a, a little bit later in the poll. I, I've, I've learned that, honey. I've learned how important that is, by the way. But uh, there was a, a couple times that I would joke around a little bit about when Tracy and I met. And, uh, and, and I had said something similar and kind of funny. I said, you know, when she asked me to marry her, I said, yes, of course. <laughs> and it was a joke at that time. And, and it was, it, you know, I thought it was understood and so on and so forth. But later I had to make a statement because people would come up to her and say, you know what, tell me about when you asked him to marry you. And so, and she's like, tell them it wasn't me that asked you, but you asked me. And so I had to clarify. I had to retract my earlier statement and say, no, this is what really happened and, and, and so on and so forth. But there was a mother-in-law involved. There was. Yeah, we're, I got a couple more weeks. You're not supposed to remind me of that, okay? So, uh, and, and so uh, there, there was another person involved, but, but all of these things happened so love could bud, so love could abound. Tracy and I had an interesting time when uh, she asked to, me to marry her. Remember, that was, that was kind of, but no, it was actually different. It was kind of funny, actually, by the way. We went on a little hike, not a little hike, a long hike up to the top of a mountain, and we went up there. There was this beautiful waterfall there, and I thought for sure this was going to be a perfect place for me to get down on my knees and ask my beautiful girlfriend, Tracy, to marry me and spend the rest of her life with me. Uh, I hid the ring in my sock. And so at the perfect time, we went over the little rail because we wanted to get a little bit closer to the, to the waterfall. I mean, I wanted this to be just perfect. And I get down on my knee, I pull out this ring, and as I flip the ring out, the ring pops out of the box. It hits a few rocks. Bing, 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 bing. And I, I jumped, I grabbed the ring from going down the waterfall all the way down the mountain. I said, honey, who are you marrying me? <laughs> now, whether she had pity on me and just said yes, I don't know. But we all have unique little situations where that's happened. And, and uh, you say, well, she was so forward. She, 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 she asked him, and it, it needs to be the other way around. Well, I, I'm, I'm here to remind you, there are some men that just need a little prompting. And sometimes the, the woman has to say, hey, 
hey, did you see that ring right there? You know, and just kind of <laughs> encourage that guy that if he does ask, she's not going to say no, okay, all right? So you know what I'm talking about with all of that. And so this was the scene. It was unusual, but she's saying, hey, take me under your wing. I'm yours. And she said, listen, you're a kinsman redeemer. You're close to me. You could be the answer to me and Naomi and, and all of the problems that we see that we're having. You could fix this thing. We see what happened here in verse number 9. And he said, who art thou? She says, I'm Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread thy skirt over thine handmaiden, for thou art a near kinsman. Look at verse 10. Look at the response of Boaz. And he said, Blessed be thou the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast not showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning. He says, you know what? You're showing more kindness now than at the beginning. In that thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. Maybe he was a little bit older. We don't necessarily know the age difference there. But she was a young widow. And he was already a wealthy man. And she, in verse number 11, it says, And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requires. You're asking me to marry you? I'll do it. For all the city of my people do know that thou art a virtuous woman. Now, I wanted to mention something here before we move on. Uh, all of the city knew that she was a virtuous woman. In verse number one, we knew, or of uh, chapter two, we learned a little bit more about Boaz. And what did we learn about Boaz? That he was a wealthy man. We know that he was a kind man. The first words that came out of his mouth were spiritual words. He says, bless you to his employees. They said, bless you back by the Lord, right? And so he was a godly man. He was a man of character. He was well known. And then we know about Ruth here. She was a very virtuous woman. If you've ever wanted to know what a virtuous woman is, Proverbs 31 covers that quite a bit. It would be a good read. It would be a good goal. It would be a good uh, goal setting. Say, hey, I want to be uh, more virtuous than I am today. Proverbs 31 would be very helpful. But she was a virtuous woman. He says, I want you to know that everybody knows you're a virtuous woman. Look at verse 12. And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman, how be it, there is a kinsman nearer than I. Now, if we go back to verse 11, how she was a virtuous woman, I am, I pause a little bit as I read this. Chapters, 85 verses, four chapters. As we are describing Boaz, as we are describing Ruth. And have you noticed, not one mention of their physical appearance. Not one mention of it. Not She was beautiful. She was fair to look upon. Nothing. And so this is a good reminder that character does count. Character is important. And she was virtuous. She was well known to be virtuous, a woman that had honor, a woman that was good. She took care of Naomi. Her character was good. She worked very, very hard. But there was a problem. We see that in verse number 13, or excuse me, 12. He says, it's true, I am thy near kinsman. I listen to you. You say, hey, you want me to marry you? I would like to do that, but there's a problem. You know, sometimes uh, in marriages, Tracy and I have been married 25 years, and one of the things that we've learned over all of these years is that love does cover a multitudes of sins. Love does cover a lot of problems. A lot of, but what if? So in marriage and love and all of that, you, you have expectations. And, and guess what? If you stick together, you know what? You can get over any obstacle, any roadblock, anything like that. And I want to encourage you. Listen, there is a great sense of uh, pride or good pride in the Lord when we see in our marriages us getting over hurdle after hurdle after roadblock and we're getting on the other side 
It is such a great opportunity to be thankful, such a great opportunity to be mindful of the goodness of God and how love does grow. And by the way, love is way more than a feeling. It is an act of our own will, and it flows out of us, and it comes in choices and different things like that. But this was something unusual. Someone else uh, was closer in relation than Boaz was in order to be that kinsman redeemer, in order to take everything that was at Lemelex and take everything that was under his, under his wings and provide for that and to be a steward of all that Elimelech had and, of course, his seed and his inheritance and all of that. But now we see this man, Elimelech, and notice the advice here. He says, I am there, but there's somebody nearer than me. And so this is what he says in verse 13. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform unto thee the part of the kinsman, well... Let him do the part of the kinsman. But if he will not do the part of the kinsman to thee, then I will do the part of the kinsman to thee. As the Lord liveth. Notice how he brought the Lord into this proposal. I think every individual interested in marriage or interested in getting married, uh, the Lord ought to be a discussion. Amen. A lot of problems are found in marriages because the Lord isn't, consulted the lord isn't thought about and it could be years down the road and finally we say well really what was the problem well we were unequally yoked we didn't have the same passions the same desires the same directions we didn't have all these these things and so he brought the lord into says listen if it's the lord's will this thing will happen and then he began to go and if you will he was a man on a mission he says, listen, I'm going to get this thing figured out. And you're going to know, you're going to know very soon. Look at verse 14. And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before anyone could know about or, or know another. And he said, let it not be known that a woman came under the floor. Now, what was all that about? Well, Boaz wanted to keep her name, her character, her virtuous reputation intact. He cared about her and wanted her to continue to have that. We see a lot about the character of Boaz, a good guy. And look at verse 15, And he said, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six bar, uh, measures of barley, and laid it on her, and she went into the city. And so he says, here, here you go. So he protected her reputation, but also he gives her some barley. And, and we kind of understand what that might have been. It might have been a, a dowry, right? It, it, it might have been a down payment on the marriage. It might have been a good faith intention. Hey, I'm gonna, I am going to provide for you, and I'm going to provide for Naomi, and I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to sacrifice for this relationship. It was like an earnest on his intention. Now, Ruth might not even understood what all that meant. She's just carrying home six measures of barley, but I'm pretty sure Naomi understood what all that was about. Boy, don't we see love here? I, I do. I mean, really, in the beginning of this chapter, Naomi loved Ruth a lot. She was willing, she didn't want her to, she wanted her to have a life. She wanted her to have a family. She wanted her to, to exist in such a good way rather than a life of the widow uh, like her. She wanted something better for her. She had Ruth's interest at heart. Boy, isn't that a good thing when we have loved ones that have our best interest in mind? Boy, don't we have situations where we really got to wonder what kind of intentions do they have? Why are you asking me this? Is it for me or for you? Or is it what is going on? But boy, love is something that demonstrates. Remember I said love is not a feeling, it's an act. 
Love is something that says, hey, I'm concerned for you. Ruth loved Naomi and said, hey, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to do everything you say. Trust is a big part of love. When Ruth, I could imagine working every single day, looking at Boaz, thinking about Boaz, thinking what a kind person he is. She said kindness earlier. I'm wondering if there was a time in her life where maybe where she grew up, maybe her father, maybe her husband, maybe whoever she's, but they weren't kind. And she could see kindness. And all that time that she worked, she saw how kind he was to the maidens, how kind he was to the workers, how kind. <coughs> so it demanded that she would do all that Naomi said. And I, I submit to you, there was a little risk involved. And you know what, love, it could be risky. You're putting your emotions out there. You're putting your, 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 uh, your feelings out there, so to speak. She risked her reputation. She risked being rejected. Sometimes nobody does anything because they don't want to be rejected. Sometimes in life, in anything, not just love, but in anything, you'll never accomplish anything unless you step out and risk. And she was willing to do that. She was willing to do that above rejection. But notice verse 11 of chapter 3, we see Boaz here showing a little love. He says, And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous. He demonstrated, listen, I will do it. I will commit. I will say yes. Now, pastor, we just, saw, we just read a love story about Ruth and Boaz and how that all happened and and, 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 okay, what's this all about? Well, I, I submit to you there could be some opportunities here to learn a little bit about ourselves and a lot about the Lord. See, the Lord here is a great picture. If we see Naomi here in the beginning, she is a great picture, if you will, of God the Father, a loving parent. A, she, she's a picture of God here that she wants the best for Ruth. She wants Ruth to go out and have the great life, a life filled with children, a life filled with promise, a life filled with inheritance. And so Naomi is a picture, I care for you, and I'm reminded of how much our Heavenly Father cares for us. We don't think He cares about us sometimes. We go through life and say, is God really there? I'm here to tell you, He's really there. And He cares for you, and He wants the best for you. And as much as... Naomi was longing for Ruth to be redeemed. So she made this plan that she might be redeemed. And this redemption plan was only possible because she had a relationship to the Redeemer. So Ruth was in the field with Boaz, and all of this plan and all of this could happen because... Boaz was qualified to be that redeemer. So, just think about it. Just think about this for just a moment. God wants the best for us. And he wants us to go out there. And he wants us to be redeemed. So much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross, a sinner's death, so that you and I could have life and life everlasting. He wants better for us than what we want sometimes, right? And we have a loving God. We think of Ruth here. Ruth is just really a great picture of the sinner, a lost sinner, someone from Moab. Someone doesn't know the customs, doesn't know what to do. She couldn't save herself. She needed somebody else. We live in a world where people are so self-sufficient. I could do it on my own. I don't need anyone else. Listen, Ruth understood greatly her situation. She could not do anything without a kinsman redeemer. And she went all out for it. Boaz gave her grace, gave her kindness, and you know what she did? She received it. She didn't harden herself. She didn't reject it because of her pride. She was humble 
And she asked, would you redeem me? She went up and said, would you take me under your wing? Would you redeem me? You're, you, you're a, a kinsman redeemer. And I'm just reminded of how the lost sinner that lives in this world needs to understand that they need a redeemer, that they cannot make it without a redeemer, and how that, you know what, no matter what we do, we need to ask the redeemer, the Lord Jesus, we need to ask him and thank him for his grace and say, hey, I want you. Can I come under your wing? Oftentimes, we are so self-reliant, we think we got everything handled. I'm here to tell you, sinner, you don't. The Bible says that you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins. Dead people can't do anything for their state, can they? They're dead. So if you're dead in your trespasses and your sins, you need somebody that can make you alive, that can be life back into your life. Here was Ruth. She had nothing. She was a widow. Naomi had nothing. She was, the Bible says that she thought she came back empty. She was lower than all low. But yet Boaz came by God's grace and redeemed them. And now they're about to have the life that God is blessing them with by God's grace. Wow. I think about Boaz for just a second. What a picture of what the Lord Jesus has done. You see, he was worthy to redeem her. He was qualified. And you know, the Lord Jesus lived a perfect life. The Bible says that he came, became flesh for us. That's the incarnation. That is Emmanuel being God with us. He came down and dwelt among us. Why? So that he could experience all the things that we experience. Why? So that when you have failed and he has not, and he's got victory on that cross, and he died, and he was buried, and he got victory over death, hell, and the grave, and he ascended up on high, guess what? You could have life too. If only you would believe. If only you would trust. If only you would call out him. And only if you would, you know what? Lay aside your pride. And you're, you know, you're worried about what people thinking. Ruth had to go. And she had to say, wait a minute. My mother-in-law gave me advice. Go and do this. I don't know. I'm going to do it. And guess what? It all worked out for her. Why? Because she went to the one who could redeem her. Amen. And you. If you're here this morning, you don't know Christ is your Savior, there is one person that can redeem your soul, and it's not you. Amen. It's not your mama, not your grandma, not your grandpa, not your friend, not your boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is. It's only Jesus. Amen. And so today is a great day to know that for sure. And I'm so thankful that Boaz was willing he didn't look upon her as an outcast, a, someone, a foreigner. He didn't look at her like, he looked at her like with humbleness and love. And he was willing to do whatever it needed to do, take to redeem her. And he did. And I'm glad that that love of the Redeemer is shown to us in this passage. So you can be thankful that God yes. loved you. Yes. What a glorious love. Glorious love. It's interesting. Look at verse 18, and we're done today. It says, and she said, so this is Naomi, sit still, my daughter, until thou knowest how the matter will fall. Now, you, you know the, who, who likes to sit still? This is a big time proposal. This is a life-changing moment. And what does Naomi say? Just sit still, be patient. You know, sometimes our life is a little like that. We do what God asks us to do. We go and be obedient. We, even though we might not understand who we are, and sometimes we just have to sit still and just see what God is about to do. Amen. In chapter 4, we're going to see how God worked it all out. It was an amazing time. It's interesting how it worked out. And we didn't know, but did you notice... Boaz here, I did just a little bit earlier in this chapter, how that he says, if he can redeem you, well, then we're going to let him redeem you. It just means that 
Maybe he loved Ruth so much that he was willing to, whatever it took to get her out of her situation, he was happy with. That's sacrificial love. Whatever it takes. So believer, you're here. I know the, the world's going uh, in hell in a handbasket, and I know things are happening, but I want to encourage you. You can trust in the Redeemer. You could trust in his love. And you could trust in what Jesus has done for you. If you know Jesus as your Savior, you just need to sit back and you just need to say, you know what, I'm going to be patient until we figure out what the matter's going to be and understand that it's going to be good because God has your best interest in his mind. If you're not saved this morning, today's a good day. Amen. You know, there's nothing like going from being lost to being found. There's nothing like being hopeless to have hope. We're going to see that in chapter 4. Naomi came back to Bethlehem empty. She said, God dealt with me bitterly. She said, I was full when I left, but I came back empty. And but nearer than she imagined, the answer for her was, it was sitting right next to her. Ruth. And the end of the story isn't always apparent to us. And I want you to be mindful of that in our times that we're living in. The end of the story, how it all works, might not be so clear to us, but the one who is going to make it happen has shown himself mightily to all of us through his son. And so let us put our faith, hope, and trust and Walk by faith in him for what he has done. Let's go out there with our heads held high, with the, the, the wonderful blessings and thanksgiving of our God on our lips so that other men may, might know that Jesus yeah, is amen. Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for this passage of scripture. Thank you for one another. And Lord, I thank you for the pictures that we see of you and Naomi and Ruth and, and how you work in our lives. And thank you that this was given to us so that we might see some principles that we can live by. And Lord, I ask, Lord, that there be anyone in our service this morning that doesn't know you as Savior, has never called upon you to be, doesn't know for sure, has never trusted in Jesus. Say, preacher, just pray for me. Maybe you're on Facebook this morning and this thought has crossed your mind many a times. How do I put my faith, hope, and trust in Jesus? It's real simple. You have to humble yourself and admit, I need a Savior. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. You need to believe who Jesus said he was. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Do you believe in him that he died and was buried and rose again? And then the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, let me encourage you, call upon the name of the Lord. If that's you, I want to encourage you to pray something similar to this. Dear Jesus, I know I need a Savior. I know I need you. I know I can't save myself. Lord, I believe that you came to this earth, you lived perfectly, you died on that cross, you were buried, and you conquered death, hell, and the grave so that I didn't have to experience it. And Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my life and to be my Savior. Jesus, help me to live for you from this day forward. Amen. Listen, if you are prayed that prayer, we'd like to know about it. We'd like to encourage you as you grow in your faith. Beginning in Jesus, let me tell you, it's not the ending. There's a great story. There's a great path. There's a great future for you. We'd love to help you and be a blessing. If you're a Christian and the Lord's spoken to you about something this morning, you know, oftentimes we, we don't do what God is telling us to do right away. We know about what's true, but we fail to do it. I want to encourage you. Whatever the Lord's speaking to you about, just be obedient and do it right away. Lord, 
I pray that you bless this invitation, have your will and way. We thank you for your love for us, and we thank you for one another. We ask, Lord, today as we commit this day, and Lord, our afternoon and our evening special service about your table, I pray that you'd help us and guide us and direct us. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, be ever-present on our minds all day long as we prepare to remember what you've done for us on the cross. Help us, Lord Jesus, in this endeavor. Bless this time of invitation, this prayer time, decision time, we pray in your name. Amen. Mike's going to sing, and as he sings, listen, if you stand with me in a prayerful attitude, just do some business with the Lord. Tell God what he's spoken to you about. And if you need to be saved, I'd love to encourage you to come down, and maybe I can show you from the Bible. With a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One, give thanks, because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One, give thanks, because He's given Jesus Christ. Let's be thankful people today as we go out and be thankful for the Lord, our Redeemer, and what He's done in our lives. Let's close in a word of prayer, and I want to remind you tonight, just plan on coming in and, and grabbing one of the communion cups there. Come on on, grab a seat, and prepare your hearts as we partake in the Lord's Supper service tonight together as a church family. Let's pray. Lord, dismiss us with your blessings. We thank you for all that you have done. We thank you for the book of Ruth, and we ask that you'd help us to see these things, these principles, apply them to our life in a great way. We love and we thank you, and we pass this in your name. Amen. God bless you, folks. You are dismissed.